Dr. Kc is brutally and fearlessly honest. His these qualities left me in complete awe, and I started to fully appreciate the term intellectual honesty and realized the basic fundamental ingredient of a strong character is honesty in one's thoughts and one's action. Ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker is Doug Casey. He is the chairman of Casey Research. He has recently written two books, Totally Incorrect and Right in the Money. It's my great honor to invite Doug to the podium to share his thoughts about the decline of Roman Empire and similarities of what has been happening in the West. Yeah. Okay, it looks like this is uh, Ancient Roman History Day after uh, Larry's speech this morning. Um, and I've got to, um, got to apologize for basically having to read this because I started writing an article uh, about Rome versus the U.S. And then I expanded it, and I think I, I might bring this up to uh, book length at some point. But anyway, let me try to com compress uh, Roman, all of Roman history and a lot of American history uh, into a uh, short period of time. So, what I want to do is I want to talk about what happened to Rome and based upon what happened to Rome, what's likely to happen to the U.S. And of course, this is a uh, going to be a presentation about the things that you're not supposed to talk about in polite company, uh, namely religion, politics, and bad-mouthing the military. And uh, I'll give you a spoiler alert. There are a lot of similarities between the U.S. and Rome. Uh, there are reasons why people uh, look to Rome as opposed to any other civilization when looking at the future of the U.S. Now, everybody knows that Rome declined, but few understand that the U.S. is well along that path. I'm going to give you a number of reasons that you may not have heard for that, too, assuming I have time to tell, you, tell them all to you. Uh, uh, Rome probably reached the peak of its military and perhaps its economic power around the year 100. Um, and I argue that's when it was at its, at its uh, absolute peak, or maybe even past its peak, uh, at the year 100. Um, you can certainly argue that the U.S. was at its relative peak, certainly, and maybe at its absolute peak uh, as early as the 1950s. Because in, the 19, in 1950, uh, the U.S. produced 50% of the world's output, uh, eighty percent of its vehicles. Now we're down to twenty-one percent of the world's output and only five percent of its vehicles to take two indicators. Uh, back in those days, the U.S. government had two-thirds of the world's gold reserves. Now it's only a quarter. It was by a large margin the world's largest creditor. Uh, now it's by a large margin the world's biggest debtor. Um, but you know, it's not just the U.S that's gone downhill. Uh, the U.S. started declining in the 1950s, which was its absolute peak, but Western civilization, uh, of which the U.S. is a, a part, uh, started going downhill earlier. I'd say the peak for Western civilization was actually about 1910 or 1912. At that point, uh, Europe controlled almost the entire world, politically, militarily, economically, but now, uh, Europe is nothing but a, uh, a Disneyland with uh, real as opposed to paper mache buildings and it's turning into a petting zoo for the Chinese. So it's even further down the slippery slope than the U.S. is. Um, you know, the U.S. has modeled itself after Rome. And if you model yourself after something, you tend to become like it. And um, uh, like America, Rome was originally ruled by kings, then it was self-governing with several, uh, several different assemblies, not just one, 
and a, a Senate. Later, the power devolved to an executive. Um, you know, we have Roman-styled architecture in Washington, D.C. The eagle is the national symbol of both countries. Uh, all of our mottos are Roman mottos in Latin. Uh, look on the back of a, a dime and you'll see the fasces, which is an axe surrounded by rods, which was a Roman symbol. And um, even when they wrote the Federalist Papers, uh, the nom de plume of the authors was Publius, who was uh, one of Rome's first consuls. And just like Rome, uh, the U.S. is distinguished by its military prowess. So, once again, when you pick a model, you tend to resemble it. Now, there's a considerable cottage industry that's developed uh, over the years comparing ancient and modern times especially since Edward Gibbon uh, wrote his Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire in, 19, in, in, in 1776, same year as Adam Smith wrote Wealth of Nations, same year as the Declaration of Independence was written, of course. Uh, I'm a fan of all three, but I've got to say that if you ever read Gibbon's <coughs> Decline and Fall, uh, six volumes, incidentally, I haven't read them all, uh, it's actually a laugh riot. He has a, Gibbon has a very subtle and acerbic wit. Uh, but since the time that Gibbon wrote Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, uh, there have been huge advances in the understanding of Rome. And they've been driven uh, mainly by archaeological discoveries. Uh, uh, there are a lot of things that Gibbon didn't know because he was basically a philologist. And he based his synthesis on, mainly on what the ancients said about themselves, uh, Roman writings. That's where he got most of his information. There was no real science of archaeology uh, in 1776 uh, when he wrote the first volume, when the first volume was published. So um, there wasn't even much done with the inscriptions on monuments or what was on the coins, not to mention scientists digging around in old villas and battle sites and so forth. And uh, actually Gibbon, like most historians, historians was actually a collector of hearsay. Um, so what do we think we know about ancient Rome uh, from the writers uh, that were current? And it's, it, it, it's a lot like uh, as if William Buckley and Gore Vidal and H.L. Mencken and Norman Mailer and George Carlin were all telling you their versions of the same event that happened only, you know, 50 years ago. You wouldn't be sure what really the case was. So it's much, much more that way when you go back 2,000 years. It's a, basically a, a study of he said, she said. So we, we can't be sure what the actual history, uh, historical realities are. But I want to try to entertain you with a few guesses um, that I've made about this, because I've read a lot of um, ancient history. It's, it's one of my hobbies. And um, I'll start by saying I'm not sure that the collapse of Rome wasn't a good thing. I think it probably was a good thing that it collapsed. Uh, and I want to talk about why I think it was an inevitable thing. Uh, there were many positive aspects to Rome, as there are to most civilizations, but there are other things about Rome uh, that I uh, very much disapprove of. For instance, it's anti-commercialism, it's militarism, and certainly post-Caesar, it's uh, centralized and increasingly totalitarian government. So, uh, why did Rome fall? Uh, in 1985, there were 210 reasons that were assembled by a, a German uh, named de Mont. And uh, some of them are uh, silly. He just took all the reasons that were put forward and listed them. And uh, some are silly, like uh, uh, racial degeneration and uh, homosexuality and excessive freedom. Uh, uh, some are redundant, just uh, the uh, different names for the same thing. And some of them seem to me to be common sense, such as financial bankruptcy, loss of moral fiber, and uh, corruption. Um, 
So it's pretty hard to summarize Gibbon's uh, gigantic work uh, briefly, but essentially Gibbon attributed the fall of Rome to two reasons, external and internal. And external were barbarian invasions, so well, everybody knows about that, and internal was Christianity. And uh, I think he's actually pretty much right. But I want to cover a bunch of other reasons in addition to those two, and I want to amplify on those two that Gibbon pinpointed. Um, now, you don't have to agree with my interpretation of these various things, as I'm going to touch on the political, the legal, the social, the demographic, ecological, mm -hmm. military, psychological, intellectual, and religious and economic uh, reasons for its collapse. But um, a little bit of history. I'm going to skip over a lot of this stuff because I just got too much stuff and we might want to discuss this later. So let me get right into uh, political reasons. It's misleading to talk about the fall of Rome, actually. Uh, you know, you've all learned in school the fall of Rome was 476 AD when the child emperor uh, Romulus Augustus, uh, oddly named because he was named after one of the mythical founders of Rome, Romulus, and Augustus was the first emperor, and he was the last emperor of Rome. But um, uh, I'm not sure that Rome fell at any particular date. It's more a question of what the paleontologists would call a punctuated disequilibrium, where things change quickly and then stay the same quickly, stay the same over time. <coughs> Republic <coughs> Republican Rome uh, fell in 31 BC with the accession of uh, Augustus, uh, the adopted son of Caesar. And that started what they called the Principate. And um, it almost disintegrated in the 50 years of the mid-third century. I mean, Rome almost really collapsed in the 250s uh, when in a space of 50 years there was almost an emperor a, a year. And nobody really knows how many there were because there were so many uh, different generals that last a few days and so forth. Uh, maybe the end of Rome uh, came in 378 when the, the Goths destroyed a Roman army at Adrianople and all the other barbarian tribes which were up there saw that this Roman army was totally destroyed and figured, well, we can do that too. And they started crossing the Rhine and the Danube. And uh, from 378, things just went into full collapse over the next 30 years. So, uh, Maybe we should use uh, the year 410 as the year for the collapse of Rome because it was the year that uh, Alaric, who was a uh, Goth, who was also a Roman general, incidentally, and also a Christian, uh, conducted a sack of Rome, uh, although it was a, a kind of gentle sack, actually. Um, and you might say that the civilization didn't really collapse until the late 600s when Islam uh, spread out and conquered the Mediterranean and took away all of the richest provinces of Rome and the, uh, well, by then it was the Eastern Roman Empire that was all that was left. Or maybe the fall of Rome only happened in 453 when Constantinople uh, fell to the uh, Turks. But maybe Rome hasn't even collapsed then because even today uh, the Pope is still there and he wears red shoes like Julius Caesar wore and he's called the Pontifex Maximus, which is, was one of Caesar's titles. So it's hard to say. But um, one certain thing you can say about Rome, is, in a, looking in a distant mirror, as it were, is that there was an accelerating trend of absolutism and centralization and totalitarianism and bureaucracy with Rome. And I think we can say that America, and I don't call it America anymore, as you know, I call it the United States. It's devolved from being America, which was a very good idea, into just one of 200 some nation states in the world, not much different from any of them at this point. Uh, I think that America entered its principate period, which was the accession of Augustus and the emperor period, 
I'd say during um, World War II, and people, Americans forget that Harry Truman was the last president of the United States, I'm no fan of Harry Truman's, but he was the last president of the US to actually go out on the streets without Secret Service guys and walk around the streets. That's totally impossible uh, in these days. So pretenses fell off in Rome over the years, just as they uh, have in the US. And by the time of uh, Diocletian, many of you are going to recognize that name because after the time of troubles in, in the mid-200s, he was the soldier emperor that, you know, tied it all back together again, and among other things, he put on draconian wage and price controls and basically started the feudal system. Um, and so historians say this was the, beget the end of the Principate, you went from the Republic to the Principate, and post-Diocletian, now it's called the Dominate, from Dominus, you're supposed to call the Emperor your Lord. So that's the story with the political generation of of Rome, and after the Dominate, the emperor was treated like an oriental potentate. I mean, previously, uh, the emperor, any common Roman citizen could approach theoretically, and actually practically, the emperor and talk to him. Uh, this was totally impossible uh, uh, once it entered the, dom uh, the, the, um, the Dominate period. So, uh, there were other things, you know, just like, uh, uh, the Senate and the councils and the tribunes with their vetoes became uh, meaningless anachronisms over as Rome degraded. The same thing has happened to U.S. Uh, institutions because by the time of Claudius, the Praetorians, uh, and Claudius was appointed by the Praetorians, the Praetorian Guard were palace guard uh, set up by Augustus. Uh, it showed that they could designate the emperor and at this point, I think it's probably true of the American Praetorian Guard, which are the NSA, the CIA, the FBI, and about a dozen others, and of course, all these generals in the military with all their special forces of one type or another. I mean, these guys are you know, seriously in charge, I think. So my guess also is that as the ongoing and deepening Greater Depression uh, evolves and the dollar is destroyed in a serious war, not just a sport war like in Iraq or Afghanistan, I'm talking a serious war, uh, gets underway. I think that uh, the bourgeoisie are going to look for a strong president and that's likely to be a, uh, a military guy because Americans think the military, which is really just a heavily armed version of the post office, and it's the only thing that it's the only thing that still appears to work uh, in the U.S. And Americans love their military, and of course, maybe you all know that the greatest presidents are all war presidents, uh, guys that started wars: Lincoln, Wilson, FDR, etc. And uh, military heroes like Andrew Jackson and. Uh, Ulysses Grant, Teddy Roosevelt, Eisenhower, it's easy to elect a, a general. So I think that's who the Republicans are going to put up the next time. That's just a guess. So as far as the military is concerned, incidentally, getting ahead of myself a little bit, uh, I'd advise you to keep Gibbon's words in mind. He said, any class of men accustomed to violence and slavery make for very poor guardians of a civil constitution. And that's what the military are. They're a class of men accustomed to violence and slavery. So he's quite correct. Anyway, let's take a look at the legal part of Rome. Uh, Romans uh, were supposedly ruled by laws, just as were supposedly ruled by laws. But in the case of Rome, it started out with 12 tablets that were engraved. Everybody could see them. 451 BC was when this happened simple dictates. And um, this started changing uh, definitively under Diocletian where everything was done by decree and no longer anybody could keep track of the laws and so forth. So this is pretty much the way it is today where there are 
there are thousands of volumes full of laws and regulations. Nobody even knows what they are until it's convenient to bring them to people's attention. But this trend accelerated under Constantine, who was another famous Roman Empire emperor, who died 325 AD, uh, and also the first um, Christian emperor. And here I'd like to start drawing Christianity into the fall of Rome, because Christianity is a top-down religion. You got God on top, and priests, and the bishops, and then the uh, bishops, and then the priests, and so forth. It's top down where these things are interpreted. So Roman religion, classical Roman religion, uh, never tried to capture men's minds that way. Uh, it was a totally different thing, classical religion, and much superior to Christianity, I think, uh, if, you want, if you want a religion. But um, before Christianity, uh, violating the emperor's laws was not seen as violating God's laws. After Christianity, you violated the emperor's laws, you're also breaking God's laws. I think the devolution is similar in the US because you'll recall that there are only three crimes in, uh, listed in the US Constitution. They happen to be treason, counterfeiting, and piracy. And um, that's all there is as far as federal laws. But uh, now if you've read Harvey Silverglate's book, uh, you'll find that there are at least 5,000 federal crimes, and he figures that the average American commits three felonies a day. So once again, I'll throw you back to, uh, well, in this case, Tacitus. And he said, the more numerous law the laws, the more corrupt the nation. Because corruption is an effect to get around the laws. What's that? To hack around the laws. So I'm all for corruption, actually, but that's a... A different, uh, a different subject. Social. Uh, how about the social similarities between Rome and the U.S.? Now, along with all the political and social, uh, political legal problems, there are social problems. Everybody knows about the useless mouths in Rome and the bread and circuses and so forth. But um, this only started uh, in the late Republic with the with the Punic Wars. Uh, and these things were mostly limited to the capital city itself uh, and a few other big cities, but it was mostly in the city of Rome itself. But the uh, bread and cir circuses kept the mob under control. And at its peak, uh, the city of Rome had about a million inhabitants, the empire itself, uh, well, I guess 60 to 100 million, uh, more closer to 60 million probably. Um, but in Rome, they had a million people, and it was a big mob, and at least 30% of them were on the dole. And the dole, now this is interesting, how long can these things last? The dole in Rome, uh, start to finish, was about 500 years. And it only was cut off uh, when wheat shipments from Egypt and North Africa were cut off with the, uh, with the uh, vandals taking over North Africa. I mean. So 500 years. I mean, these things can last a long time. I don't think that uh, uh, the welfare programs we have are going to do as well. Another thing, kind of interesting, is the demographic comparison of Rome and the U.S. Uh, the empire appears to have suffered a demographic collapse uh, late in the second century, about the time of Marcus Aurelius, the famous emperor that you all saw in, in Gladiator, which incidentally was a reasonably historically accurate movie. As incidentally, that series on HBO called Rome was very compressed, obviously, but it was pretty good, I think. And written by John Milius, uh, an excellent writer. Anyway, um, at that point, uh, commerce started falling and the standard of living dropped radically with the constant warfare as well as the welfare. But the problem wasn't that people were just dying with plagues and uh, uh, constant warfare, but they actually weren't reproducing. And once again, I'll draw you back to Christianity, because Christianity uh, thought the body was evil, the Virgin Mary was good, you should become a nun, you should become a monk, you shouldn't reproduce, sex was bad. And this is probably uh, another reason why the demographic collapse uh, occurred 
in uh, ancient Rome, just as you know, it's occurring now in the OECD countries because uh, af after World War II, uh, American women averaged 3.7 children apiece. Now it's 1.8. It's immigration that makes the population grow, not reproduction. You need at least 2.1 for the population to just stay stable. And in parts of Europe, uh, people are reproducing at 1.3 per woman. So it's a severe demographic collapse. The same thing happened in Rome, incidentally. Uh, and I'll go into why I think the reasons are quite similar. Uh, now, it's partially due to an understanding of birth, birth control, of course. But uh, a growing reason, and I think it was similar in Rome, is that people just can't afford it. It's an expensive proposition having kids now or in the declining days of Rome when it was an economic collapse. So, and the last part, of course, is that uh, if it was Christianity that provided the moral underpinning for not reproducing in those days, today it is decreasing your carbon footprint, which I'll lead into. I think the whole, what I'm leading up to is this whole greenism movement is like the new Christianity. It's a, I mean, Christianity was a bed bug that was sucking away the vitality of Rome, just as greenism and things of that nature are today. I, I don't want to offend you Christians in the audience, but I, I'm calling it the way I see it, okay? Uh, now let's talk about the military for a moment. Uh, wars made Rome. Uh, it started, this is interesting, Rome started out as a republic of farmers, uh, each with his own plot of land. Uh, it was a republic, totally a republic of farmers, very much like the U.S. started out. And uh, as wars expanded the country's borders, uh, it brought in wealth. But those wars sowed the seeds of destruction in Rome, just as they have in the U.S. And of course, the big ones were the wars against Carthage from 264 to 146 B.C. That's when the republic really turned the corner. Uh, in those days, you had to be a landowner to... Uh, join the Roman army. Right, forget about the draft, forget about hiring mercenaries. They wouldn't take you unless you were a landowner, not just a citizen. Yeah, no riffraff involved, it was a great honor. So uh, the problem was, is that when the Romans fought these wars, you might be gone for five or 10 or more years. And meanwhile, uh, your wife and kids back at the farm had trouble maintaining it. They might have to borrow money if the crop went bad. Or... So uh, what happened is, is that by the time the soldiers got back, especially from the Punic Wars, uh, the farms were in disrepair, disrepair, you know, wife maybe thought he was dead, remarried. Uh, and of course, like soldiers anywhere, you go off to war, raping and killing for however many years, you pick up some bad habits that you might not have had before. <clears throat> so, uh, in addition to that, in those days, uh, war could be a very profitable enterprise. Why? Uh, you see this, you see a fat, rich country over there. Okay, if you've got a good military and the Romans had the best military, you invade it, what happens? You, you steal all the gold and artwork and uh, steal all the women and all the cattle and enslave all the men and children or, that you didn't kill, this is very profitable. The slaves had, you know, huge value. And then, well, whatever's left, you know, you could tax it and more money would come in for at least a period of time. So, warfare looked good to the Romans. I mean, really, you, conquer and steal and it all flows into the capital city and that's where the votes are. So war was a good thing for them actually. But on the other hand, the soldiers pick up bad habits, the yeoman farmers go away, um, then you start importing grain from North Africa and Egypt because they're not growing it anymore in Italy. Uh, and this tidal wave of slaves that you brought in uh, to work the freshly uh, confiscated properties, they're a social problem. Uh, 
So I, I think, uh, like, uh, so like America, Rome became much more urban and less agrarian over time. And it became a giant industrial <clears throat> latifundia. Now, um, well, let's see, Spain and North Africa, is that worth covering? Anyway, the wars helped destroy the essential Roman fabric that I think you could argue made, it, made Rome great. Got to pick up the pace here a little bit. Interesting stuff, I thought, but okay. Uh, ba -ba -ba. Uh, let's see, all right. Stream of wealth uh, stopped flowing into Rome after Trajan conquered Dacia, today's Romania, in, uh, in 1006, uh, or I, sh I should say 106. Um, now, nothing more to conquer. They've already looted everything through taxes. A lot of now, they got a problem because there are barbarians on the borders that are becoming Romanized, and they're picking up better weapons and better techniques. They're becoming wealthier. They're seeing all this wealth there. So now, instead of being aggressive and reaching out to steal and plunder, which was good well, for them, uh, now they've got these barbarian hordes that they've got to defend against. So instead of a yeoman army of citizen landholders, now you've got to pay professionals to defend the borders, and this is expensive, and taxes went way up, and that had all kinds of consequences I don't have to explain to you all. So, in any event, <coughs> that's what happened to Rome's military, and I will say that I think the same thing is happening to the U.S. military at this point. Everybody knows that here that the U.S. spends about as much militarily as well, not quite the rest of the world put together, but the next 40 countries put together. So it's bankrupting the country. And uh, I live in Argentina a good part of the year, most of the year actually. And are you aware of the fact that it was three years ago, now everybody knows what a mess the Falklands War against the British was, but do you know that three years ago, the Argentines had a destroyer that was sitting at the dock and it sank at the dock and healed over 45 degrees. They just didn't have the money to maintain it. This is incredible. An actual naval destroyer sinks at the dock and heals over 45 degrees. So could this happen? It happened to the Soviet Navy. It happened to the Soviet Navy. Could it happen to the US Navy? Yeah, I think it might, actually. Uh, the military doesn't defend the U.S. The military is in the process of destroying the U.S. And I think it's increasingly ineffective uh, in the way warfare is going because, you know, a, a thousand dollar uh, Strela uh, shoulder launch missile, missile will definitely take out a low flying uh, 50 million dollar F-16 and a $150 IED will definitely take out a $5 million M1 tank. And an Arab teenager with an AK-47 will definitely take out a US soldier, which costs about a million dollars with the training, the equipment, the benefits. So it's a matter of economics. War is just a matter of economics. And the way the wars are going to be fought, kind of like open source warfare where you're fighting a hundred different groups. They may hate each other, but they hate you more, and they all watch each other and trade techniques. It'll bankrupt the U.S., and the U.S. is stupid enough to use World War II technology, basically, B-2 bombers and F-35 fighters, which is probably a piece of junk, uh, to, to fight Arab teenagers. Forget about it. You're not going to win. So, anyway. It's the same as Rome, actually. Now, let me give you an interesting quote here. Uh, this is uh, from a guy named Priscus, who was the uh, Roman ambassador to the court of Attila, when Attila was already occupying uh, parts of what are now Hungary and Germany, that, that Rome kind of Switzerland and so forth. Okay, so while uh, Priscus is in the uh, court of Attila, and he's from Constantinople, 
Uh, while he's there, he met a Greek who joined the barbarians. So Couscous met one of his countrymen who joined the barbarians, the, the Huns. And here's the story uh, he tells to Priscus. He said, the Greek says to Priscus, after the war, the Scythians live in inactivity, enjoying what they have gained, harassed very little or not at all. The Romans, on the other hand, are very liable to perish in war as they have as they have to rest their hopes of safety on others and are not allowed on account of tyrants to use arms. Incidentally, once the Dominique came, uh, the Ab Roman, unless you were in the army or very upper class, you had no right to bear arms. You're, the Romans were all disarmed. That's what he's talking about here. And, and they were useless for the army. They didn't know how to use them. So, he says, and those who use them are injured by the cowardice of their generals who cannot support the conduct of war. But the condition of subjects in time of peace is far more grievous than the evils of war, for the exaction of the taxes is very se severe. And unprincipled men inflict injuries on others because the laws are practically not valid against all classes. So, this is testimony from well, about the year 450, when Rome was... Same thing, you could say these things today. Uh, now, just to placate you druids in the audience, if there are any, uh, actually, environmental degradation may have had something to do with the collapse of Rome. Uh, soil exhaustion, deforestation, <coughs> and pollution, abetted by plagues, uh, which abetted plagues, I should say, were all problems for Rome. Uh, an analogy today? Well, I don't know. Uh, Rick and I have certainly talked about the dangers of these gigantic monocultures. You drive across the central plains of Canada and the U.S., it's just mile after mile after mile of the same plant. And this just seems to me like an accident waiting to happen, the right fungus or the right bug or the right something. And in addition to that fact, you can argue that although they pour a lot of chemical fertilizers on the plains, and the micronutrients aren't there, and the little <coughs> bugs and bacteria are all killed by pesticides. There's no worms in the soil. They're killed all by the pesticides and, and, and such. I don't know. Environmental de degradation, the fact that the the, the, like Ogallala Reservoir and other things are being drained to grow corn and such. Well, I don't know, it's an argument. But um, incidentally, one of the reasons for the collapse of Rome was that um, it was one of those cyclical warm periods in between roughly 200 BC and 200 AD. It happened in the Han Dynasty of China too, and it was coincident with their rise. Same thing in in Rome, and oddly enough, the world got noticeably cyclically cooler, uh, starting about the year 200, which is about when things started to collapse. Uh, incidentally, I don't believe in global warming. I think the chances are better we're going to go into a, a new ice age than go into the, the super warming nonsense that they promote. I mean, that's a whole different thing. So let's talk about economics for a moment. Uh, I gave you a quote from Priscus, who was one amb ambassador. This is Salvian, who was uh, 10 years earlier than uh, Priscus. This is about 440 uh, AD. And um, uh, Salvian says, but what else can these wretched people wish for? They who suffer the incessant and continuous destruction of public tax levies. He's talking about his fellow Romans. He says, to them, there is always imminent a heavy and relentless proscription. They desert their homes, lest they be tortured in their very homes. They seek exile, lest they suffer torture. The enemy is more lenient to them than the tax collectors. This is proved by the very fact that they flee to the enemy in order to avoid the full force of the heavy tax levy. Therefore, in the districts taken over by the bar barbarians, there is one desire among all the Romans that they should never again find it necessary to pass under Roman jurisdiction. In those regions, it is the one and general prayer of the Roman people that they be allowed to carry on the life they lead with the barbarians. So that's uh, from the horse's mouth, 440 AD. 
Now, you can't imagine somebody at the time of Cicero or Caesar or even Marcus Aurelius saying anything like that because it wasn't true. So, I'd say that things are getting similar in the U.S. But uh, incidentally, um, when Constantine instituted Christianity as a state religion, it got worse for the economy, and not because of a class of priests who are now supported by taxes. This was never the case, incidentally, with previous Roman religions. No, the state didn't pay for these things. Private people paid for it. But uh, once the, the, the church took over under Constantine, it was a state religion. It was supported by this class of useless mouths called, called uh, practicing uh, priestcraft were supported by the state. And also, I've got to say, with its attitude of uh, waiting for heaven and its belief that this world was just a, a horrible test, it encouraged the Romans to hold material things in low regard and essentially despise money and wealth. Negative. I'm building a case here of why Gibbon was right, and Christianity was a parasite that actually just was not, it was one of the major causes of the collapse of Rome. So let's go into this a little bit further. And um, I have a question. Yeah. Sure. You were just saying it was a religion state plan or something. Mm -hmm. What could you elaborate on the state plan before that? Well, once, once uh, Christianity became the state religion of the Roman Empire in 323 AD, uh, and especially as the decades went on and became more powerful, it became, and other religions were illegalized in 378 under Valentinian. I mean, all these priests and churches, they were all financed by the state. Taxes, along with the legions and everything else. Uh, it made no sense to be a Roman anymore. So it's indirectly paid for by the state, directly paid for by the people. Right. Yeah. No, I'm well aware of the distinction that you're yeah. making. Right. OK. So all right. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that uh, this, 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 this may interest you. It's that, it's that uh, over time, Christianity has mutated. And uh, it was a very, very different thing, Christianity, in the early days of Rome, up until Constantine and even a little after that, uh, when it was uh, complicit in the fall. In other words, Christianity changed. It used to be the, um, the, the peace and Jesus and pacifism and turn the other cheek and all this type of thing when it was growing. But once it became the state religion, it was onward Christian soldiers and it, it mutated and changed its character. So let me go into this a little bit more. Um, now, Christianity today is still the dominant religion uh, in American culture, but unlike in late antiquity, when it was very pacifistic, Christianity is actually now very warlike. And it has been for a long time. We got the Crusades and the religious wars, uh, onward Christian soldiers. I'll bet the Muslims love to hear that song. Uh, uh, and conservatives all believe in God and guns. They think that's what America is based on. Uh, so it's actually a paradox that the US military today is a hotbed of Christianity, uh, because today's religion is very money and material prosperity oriented. You've got the rich and corrupt Catholic Church. I, I speak as an ex-member of this cannibalistic death cult, incidentally. It's like, oh, it's like only Jews can say bad things against Jews, and only blacks can, can, can say nigger. Well, OK, I'm an ex-Catholic, so I can say these things for those of you who are politically correct. Um, so it's a paradox that the U.S. military is a hotbed of Christianity, and it is, incidentally, because uh, fundamentalist preachers, Calvinists, Mormons, all of them are very uh, money-grubbing in principle, and that's a 180-degree change from the founding principles of the church in those early centuries when it helped to destroy Rome. 
uh, Christianity has become a very conservative force that's antithetical. I'm talking about Christianity as a whole to its founding principles. And I would suggest that Christianity today occupies the place of classical religion in late Rome. Now this is kind of interesting, uh, I think. Uh, and I'll tell you why before I run out of time. I'm not even going to get into the second law of thermodynamics, which I think is really what's going to bring this stuff all down. Okay, what are you going to do? Uh, in any event, in the, in the days of classical Rome, everybody believed in gods and sacrificed to them, but towards the end it was just paying lip service to the gods. Uh, and that's true of Christianity today in the U.S. and especially in, in Europe, I, I think. Uh, traditional uh, tr Christianity is being replaced by new secular religions. Uh, it used to be Marxism, which is a secular religion, that's fading. Uh, democracy is another secular religion, that's ascendant. But actually, greenism and environmentalism are the real hot tickets uh, to replace Christianity for religions. And for those who want a more conventional God, you can go to Islam, which is by far the world's um, fastest growing religion. And the process is much further along in Europe than it is in the U.S. So I think that it's important uh, if a civilization is going to survive, it, it, it should really have some common core beliefs. And just as the Romans lost their spiritual rudder with the ascendancy of Christianity, uh, the Europeans already have, and the Americans aren't far behind. So uh, I don't want to go into all these things uh, about Apollonius of Tyana and how Jesus was the Chris Angel of his day and all this type of thing. Forget about that, because I don't have any time anymore here. <laughs> but um, uh, oh. Anyway, what I'd like to do, because I do have time for this, I think, is debunk some of the Christian virtues and show you how these things, when they insinuated themselves into Roman society, actually helped to destroy uh, the good things about Rome. Um, the cardinal virtues of Christianity, everybody know what they are? No good Christians here? Few, one. Okay, faith, hope, and charity. You've all heard of that, okay? And people consider these things virtues. They're vices. Uh, I mean, faith is believing in the unknown and the unbelievable. It's not a virtue. Uh, hope is counting on magic to kiss everything and make it better. And uh, I mean, neither of these are uh, formulas for success in the material world. And, and charity, which is the most uh, cardinal virtue, according to St. Paul, uh, one of the most bent psychotics in world history, from my point of view, actually. Um, and it almost always promotes the dissipation of capital. Time, energy, emotion, uh, dissipates it to aid those who have generally done zero to deserve anything. Uh, so a rich civilization like ours can last for a while with these flaws. But nobody really, people just pay lip service to them today. But in the early days of the church, people took that stuff seriously. And the Romans didn't have the kind of accumulated capital. They, they couldn't afford these things. And let me go further. Uh, the Christian virtues are destructive, but their seven deadly sins are totally ass backward also. Let's take a look at the seven deadly sins that are promoted by Holy Mother the Church, or Christianity in those days. They were synonymous, notwithstanding all the heresies like Arianism and God knows how many there were. Anger, okay? That's a set, one of the seven deadly sins. Now, I'd say anger is certainly a fault, but it can often be righteous and justifiable. Uh, greed. Uh, I agree with Gordon Gecko. Our greed can actually be good when it represents a drive to be uh, productive. It's enthusiasm for, for being productive, actually. And pride, uh, unless we are talking about arrogance or, or hubris, which are different things, uh, it's properly just self-esteem, and it's a virtue. Uh, gluttony, gluttony, sloth, and lust are really more, no more than character flaws and bad habits. I don't approve of these things particularly, but, but they're, not, uh, car, they're not cardinal sins. 
And of the uh, so-called seven deadly sins, only envy, actually, I, I consider to be an actual vice. But we can go further about how, the, how, how Christianity insinuated itself and destroyed the Roman culture that built it, uh, the good things of it. How about the Beatitudes? Everybody's supposed to love the Beatitudes. You know, Jesus on the Mount, you know. Well, let's debunk those. Uh, blessed are the poor in spirit. What? <laughs> I, I mean, it's, 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 it's actually ignoble. It, it's ignoble to uh, bless those that don't have self-respect and the ability to accomplish things that can actually make you rich in spirit. And how about this? Blessed are they who mourn. And the, the Romans who heard this had to conclude that Christianity was a sad sack, whiny religion. And it was. Initially, the only ones that practiced Christianity were the slaves and the poor and the women because they were downtrodden. And they, no, it, it was. So, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the land. And this is no overt untruth. Uh, it's a lie. Uh, the meek are generally those without backbone. They generally don't get the land. They get what they deserve. I'm of the opinion that almost everybody gets what they deserve. I mean, I, I like the concept of justice. Uh, but wait, there's more. There are more, there are more uh, vices disguised as virtues by Christianity. How about the vows that most Christian priests take? Poverty, chastity, and obedience. Poverty? It's despicable. Uh, it makes, what does it do? It makes you a liability to others. I mean, <laughs> and to the Romans, it made you one step up from a slave. Uh, chastity, uh, ridiculous. It, it, it takes away one of the great pleasures of life, and the failure of Christians to reproduce in order to practice it was a major cause of population collapse. And obedience, it's another slave characteristic. No wonder the the, the Romans despised Christians. They didn't even consider them worth talking about. Uh, it's a slave characteristic. Free men don't see obedience as a virtue. So, anyway, the pagans ha incidentally separated uh, religion uh, from ethics. Uh, uh, religion to the ancients was a way of, of giving cult, which is the uh, origin of our word culture to the gods. And the gods were, in effect, personifications of nature and of noble concepts. Uh, the determination of what was right and wrong and just and unjust and good and evil, that was left to philosophers, not to religious people that were reading dogma out of some book that you had to take as the word of God. So, of course Christianity uh, aberrated. Um, what were pagan virtues, you're wondering? Or what did the Romans, pre-Christianity, hold in high regard? There were things like honor, courage, hospitality, generosity, fortitude, foresight, strength, perseverance, forbearance, honesty, wisdom, and justice. Little overlap, very little, between those virtues and the Christian virtues. Now you can see how you could have a strong and noble culture under pre-Christian conditions and how that would fall apart afterwards. Uh, incidentally, I'm not opposed to religion per se, just for your information, uh, insofar as it's an inquiry into the possible spiritual nature of man. So I don't see religion, if you define it that way, as being a bad thing at all. Uh, it's just that I think some regions are not. And these moral things are very important when we're talking about the collapse of an empire because it was Napoleon who said correctly in warfare the spiritual, psychological is to the material as three is to one. So it's very important. Now, we have new religions here that are equivalent to Christianity in early Roman times before it became the state religion when it flip-flopped. Uh, and it's doing the same thing to American culture. So I don't consider today's Christianity, I, it's perverse, but it's, 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 it's not the, it's not the, uh, it's not the, uh, Paris, it's not the tapeworm that it was in Roman times. Um,
So the ancient Romans wanted everybody to worship his own gods and so forth. Won't go into that, no time. So let me see what I really wanted to say about this. Okay, well, classical religion implied man had to save himself. Okay, that's what philosophy was all about. And um, it encouraged personal responsibility, because you were responsible for yourself. Uh, but Christianity tells you to rely on Jesus, and that encourages irresponsibility. Somebody is going to save me, okay? You know, uh, but uh, greenism and democracy tell you to sacrifice yourself to the planet and the collective. And the original Christian message uh, has been de-emphasized and replaced with Christian, Christian right, righteousness and triumphalism in, in recent centuries. But now greenism is replacing Christianity as a source of guilt and a reason for self-abasement. Self uh, am I not right? I mean, you're an evil person. If you drive your car or you don't ride a bicycle or do all these things, you know the drill. So it used, Christianity used to hold that anything that seems at odds with revealed truth is anathema, like Islam does today. Uh, Islam is at about the same stage of development as Christianity was in the 13th and 14th centuries. So, yeah, it's just a stage they're going through, I hope. But. Um, <laughs> Anyway, in almost every, every area underpinning Christianity, Christianity and its attitudes were termites eating away at ancient civilization. So let me see what I really want to say here. I didn't number my pages. Isn't that foolish? <laughs> when you have all this paper and you don't number them, now, now you're in real trouble. <laughs> um, yeah, and I've already skipped over some good stuff, but you're not, the reason you're here isn't to listen to a lecture on ancient Rome. Uh, but let me say this, what's really going to bring down the United States? You're, you're wondering. All this stuff is, the similarities with Rome and Christianity and Greenism, all this type of thing, that's all important. But the biggest thing that I'll draw to your attention, and one thing that Gibbon didn't consider, because nobody really understood it and knew it existed is the second law of thermodynamics. I don't know how many of you guys have considered that, but it's one of the few laws I believe in. <laughs> Whether you want to or not. That's right. And <clears throat> basically, the second law holds that entropy conquers everything and that over time, all systems wind down and degrade. Um, and the more complex systems become, the more energy it takes to maintain them. And the more complex and interconnected and interdependent they become, the more prone they are to break down and catastrophic failure. And that includes countries and civilizations. And the Romans reached their physical limits within the confines of their scientific, engineering, economic, and other types of knowledge. And the moral values of the civilization and their founding philosophies were washed away by new religion. Now, we may reach our technological uh, limits, and our founding fathers are certainly being washed away. Now, it's true that our scientific and technical knowledge is still compounding rapidly here in the West. And the reason for that is that there are more scientists and engineers alive today that have lived in all of human history previously. So, that's good. Things are gonna continue advancing. But maybe only advancing like the momentum on a flywheel that winds down. Because in order to do giant science and engineering products, projects, you need capital. And I'm afraid capital itself is being destroyed. That's what all the debt we have is about. When you have savings, it means that you've been producing more than you consume. Savings are a sign of that. When everybody is in debt, like the government and like the average American, it means you've been consuming more than you produce. Well, how is that possible? Well, there's two ways it's possible. One is you borrow the capital that other people have saved over many years past and take on debt for that. Or the other thing is you mortgage your future. That's how you do it. So I think that's actually happening at this point. 
And the, I think the, if there's not enough capital, uh, scientific and engineering productivity is going to slow down. That's why they don't have any science and engineering in Zimbabwe. There's no capital in Zimbabwe to, to finance. Uh, same thing could happen here. So, my solution to America's decline and fall, you all know what that is, you're all libertarians, so we don't need to preach to the choir anymore. What else am I going to say? Um, well, I guess I'd say that Rome was corrupt and it deserved to collapse, and certainly towards the end, all these things, food, <coughs> and fuel, and rare goods and spices all came into Rome. And what went out of Rome? Nothing but trucks full of garbage and things they'd throw in the Tiber, more garbage and dead bodies and, and laws. And that's why it collapsed, because as it got bigger and bigger and rose to a million people, the second law took over. I mean, got to keep bringing more energy in, and at some point it's not possible. So I could, I'm not going to go on about that. But anyway, even when Rome collapsed, incidentally, whether you want to pick the time of collapse as the mid-200s or the late 300s or the early 400s or the late, you know, even after uh, things really did collapse uh, in the 500s and 600s, it, it appears from writings that we have that there were people on the fringes of the empire in places like Lusitania, which is Portugal, way down on the fringe, uh, or Mauritania, on the fringe of the Sahara, where people were living just as good as they did during the first century, and you know, their villas in the country and all of that. So, on the other hand, if you were in the capital itself when the barbarians were looting and pillaging, it wasn't so pleasant. But uh, I don't know what's going to happen in the next decade. I'm kind of putting my money on uh, ugly collapse, quite frankly. But um, I don't know. And in the long run, it doesn't make any difference because as a solipsist, I think this is all a figment of our ma imagination anyway. So just, just enjoy the show. And, I mean, all these facts about Rome, for all I know, they were made up by a George Carlin equivalent. And the, the writings that we have. So I, I think we're almost over. I've probably got five minutes of time for uh, any questions or something like that, though. Oh, good. So who's got some thoughts on the coming collapse of Western civilization and the past collapse of Roman civilization? Anybody? Sorry. I heard one of your podcasts on YouTube where you say it's hopeless. America as as we knew uh, will cease to exist. It's, it's, it's the formal conclusion is gone. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's true. Everything changes. I mean, look, America has been actually, like I said, it's been going downhill relatively and absolutely since the mid to late 1950s. But the trend started well, it's like I gave you a, a thousand years worth of possible dates for the collapse of Rome. You can do the same for America. Maybe the collapse started in earnest with the Spanish-American War, and then World War I, and all that. But maybe it started with Lincoln. Maybe it actually started just after the country was founded with the Alien and Sedition Acts. I mean, they happened like, uh, like five years or something like that after the Constitution was formed, and already, this, this was like the, um, the Patriot Act of its day. So, uh, you know, the, the second law is grinding away at everything. Unless you constantly put more energy, things get more decrepit and they move. It's like a human body. It's the same thing. It's disgusting. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, you know, the rest of that saying, but it's not serious. Uh, <laughs> so what's your solution? Well, I, I said I didn't go into my solution. We're all libertarians. You know what the answer is. I mean, it's, it's a moral upright, uh, right, it's moral righteousness and and uh, economic sanity and 
essentially anarchism and all that. But that's not going to happen. You can forget about that. And if you talk about that too seriously, once the next serious war starts, uh, once again, not a sport war, but a serious war, uh, you better not. That's why H.L. Mencken doubled, dummied up during birth, both World War I and World War II. He didn't want to be lynched by these other uh, chimpanzees. And they were much less like chimpanzees in his era than they are in ours, uh, in my opinion. So no, you can't do anything about it. I mean, uh, I'm an idiot saying the things that I do in public. I, I, they may do a little bit of good. It's like, it's like Jesus said, it's appropriate that I do a, a quote from Jesus, uh, who has some very quotable quotes, let those who have ears hear. And I do it because I believe in good karma, quite frankly. But is it intelligent? Uh, no, not very. <laughs> No fans of Rome here. I'm surprised. Oh, Jeff. Well, yes, I was very interested in your, your comments on early Christianity. I'm, I'm, I know that from my own readings of the Church Fathers, uh, it's a, it sometimes seems like a different religion from what you get in like the second millennium after its contact with Judaism and, and Islam and Spain and of course the St. Thomas of Aquinas and the emergence of the scholastic like a Like a whole different aesthetic, a different some sort of moral structure and different outlook towards commerce. Everything's very different. I'm wondering, uh, well, what, what your comments would be on, on that, and more generally, uh, just the adaptability of Christianity through the ages of different cultures and different times and, and places, and mm -hmm. what that says about its theological structure. Well, uh, to start out with, uh, you know, to me, uh, Jesus was just one of many uh, social and political and religious radicals wandering around <coughs> Palestine at that time. Uh, he had the misfortune, good fortune to be crucified, but he had the super good fortune to have St. Paul, uh, Paul of Tarsus, you know, kind of take a liking to what he said. And there are actually two religions. One is the one, if you read what Jesus actually said, and a lot of it's, I think, very acceptable and intelligent. And then you read what Paul says in the epistles, and they're totally different religions. I mean, he was the first one <coughs> that really got on message with something else. And then, because he was puritanical, and he was anti-woman, and he was doctrinaire, horrible person. I mean, I think from all, just about every point of view. And then all the early fathers of the church uh, especially starting in the second and third centuries, these guys were ultra double doctrinaire, puritanical, horrible people. And, you know, then it mutated again with, with St. Thomas Aquinas. And uh, so, you know, uh, Karl Marx was quite correct. I mean, the, the church adopts itself like a, uh, like a chameleon to the if it can't mold society, then it's molded by society. It's true everywhere in the world. It's, it's, on, its, it's on its way out. Christianity is on its way out. Uh, Mary became a virgin in 1200. Uh, yeah, people, they, they argue, they've been arguing about this stuff. And was Jesus God or man or was he both? And, there have been just hundreds of thousands of people that have gotten the virginity uh, was became part of the, the whole thing in the ecumenic council mm. of 1200. Well, yeah, because priests could get married before then too. So, you know, maybe that was a, a secondary surge of Puritanism. I don't. It's a good question. Good, good answer. Yes, sir. Uh, I have another religious question. Where is this greenism going to? Like, what's what's the natural end of this now? Where's it heading? Hmm. Well, I don't know. Look, on the one hand, I'm optimistic. On the other hand, I believe in Einstein. And I think his most famous uh, observation was, after hydrogen, stupidity is the most common thing in the universe. So who can tell where it's going to end? It could go on and on. Greenism, where is it going to end? It's all around you here. Every, even out here in this uh, lobby, I'm looking at there's, there's four different places that you have to choose where to put your trash. 
And I'll, if I was the trash man, I'd just throw them all together after the, after the idiots feel good about it. here or here or here. I just they'll throw it all in my dump truck, which is probably what happens. It's, it's, all, it's all a giant sham. But do you think it's detrimental to like the economy? And I, I think it is in a, in a way. But yeah, is there it any is. Way around it? Yeah. What what what's what what is what is good for the economy is people is a, is a free market creating more wealth. And all this greenism actually destroys wealth from stopping things from happening and <coughs> consuming capital by making it slower and harder to do things and do anything, build a factory, hire a person, find a mineral deposit. You can't do anything without bureaucrats. And of course, the nature of bureaucracy is not to do anything, because you can get in trouble doing stuff. And there's no upside, no profit by doing stuff. So the world's becoming more bureaucratized and much more financialized. I mean, that was a comment Rick made that was quite correct. I mean, brokers serve a purpose, but when one out of three people in the world are brokers, I'm not sure they serve that much of a purpose anymore. <laughs> <laughs> are you familiar with uh, Joseph Tinker's work on the complex of class of complex class? I haven't read that book. i got to read that book. Oh, yeah, because what you're talking about <clears throat> almost parallels the discussion yeah. and the point that where he focuses on, which he, he didn't bring up, was the uh, the energy collapse, or the rising price of energy. So whereas Rome uh, had basically a, a source of cheap solar energy by looting the, the countries it was conquering, and then with, with America, he pretty much got a, a fossil fuel-based economy, and the price of fuel in terms of barrels of oil per barrel oil and per barrel out is constantly increasing. And I don't really see enough libertarians, I think, talking about how is this complex society going to survive this rising price of, of energy. And uh, I really think a libertarian society is a low-energy society. It's a decentralized society. And, and the, only, the only example Tinker gives of an example of a, of a society that collapsed and survived was the Byzant Byzantine Empire, about you know, 600 where they basically broke up the army and said, around, okay, this is your hill, your town, you farm it, you defend it, see you later, we'll be, we'll be there. Yeah, well, as far as energy is concerned, it should be a complete non-problem. And therefore, unless the political and social things get much worse, energy shouldn't be, because infinite energy from the sun, they, they should have decades ago put up gigantic multi-square mile solar collectors to microwave energy down to the earth. They should have, could have done that. I mean, if, if it hadn't been for the greens, we'd all, we wouldn't be on uh, second generation or third generation nuclear power plants. We'd already have little nuclear power plants the size of a few of these tables that would be, you know, be producing uh, megawatts enough to power a city with no maintenance for you know, a decade or two. I mean, the things that we could have had if, if it hadn't been for uh, politics, I mean, it should be no problem. You bring in all that extra energy, you can do lots more things. I mean, we should already be colonizing the planets. I mean, we shouldn't be rooting around for copper and, and uh, nickel and other essential elements. Uh, and low-grade deposits uh, should be mining the asteroids for them, you know, cheaply, uh, with infinite solar power and no gravity and some, you know, I mean, these, it's all politics and stupidity as far as I'm concerned. I mean, listen, ultimately, listen, maybe Ray Kurzweil is right, and within 20 years, that's what he estimates, and he's been pretty right so far on his timeline of what's going to happen, maybe we'll have the singularity. So if you can live another 20 years, maybe you'll get to live forever in some form anyway, <laughs> identifiable as you, maybe. So, you know, there's lots of cause for optimism. But uh, barring deus ex machina devices such as I've been bringing up, 
Yeah, the U.S. is going to collapse, the same as Rome did, and the same as the Athenian Empire did before it. And the, you know, this is the way the world works. Death is part of life. Okay, thanks, guys.